Welcome back to another segment of Behind the Scenes of the Waltons. I hope you all enjoyed a very happy holidays, a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, uh, and all of that. I had a very quiet Christmas, but it was very nice. So as we approach 2023, I thought I would take some more of your questions from 2022 in this segment of Ask Judy. Someone asked why we didn't use a real house because I've spoken about the exterior of the house being just a facade, things like that, and other of my guests have talked about coming on to the set for the first time and being aware of the fact that it wasn't a real house, that there was nothing really inside it, and then we went on to the sound stage to shoot all the interiors and and that uh, sets were doubled up and things like that. Um, we didn't use a real house because we were shooting on the Warner Brothers lot and there really weren't any real full houses there on the lot. And it's just time-wise, it was more efficient, more time efficient to use the existing sets that were actually on the studio lot. So we could make a company move from the back lot to the soundstage or the soundstage to the house in a relatively short period of time. Uh, when you work within an actual house, there are certain restrictions because you can't remove walls. So if somebody is up against a wall and you're shooting a person that's maybe shoved them up against the wall and they're you know shaking them and stuff and then you want to come around behind them, you can't get behind that wall. Sometimes spaces are just a little small to get the camera where you really want it. Whereas when you have a set that has been built, all those interiors, then those walls are all movable. And so you can get into virtually any position on the set that you would need to. Or if you want to get creative, you can. And you can shoot from up high and because there's no ceilings. So you, you can light it easier. Uh, and things like that. We had on our soundstage with all of the sets, there was rigging up above. So there were catwalks and there were places that had been set when they, when they put that set together, they rigged it up above so that all of those different sets could have lights already hung up above. So it was much faster to go in and kick on the lights that they wanted on and then add anything on just on the floor that they wanted. But if you go into a whole new set, an existing house or something, which happens quite frequently when you're filming these days, they rent houses, rent people's houses, and they use them. You have to bring all the equipment in. You know, if you were going to use it and then maybe you weren't going to come back for a couple of weeks, well, you either rent the house for the whole season or you have to keep bringing the equipment in and out and setting it all up, and that just takes a lot of time. So uh, nowadays, because you can do more lighting with smaller instruments and less light because of a lot of the digital work that's done, it's a little easier. But we were kind of at that transition period with the Waltons coming from earlier shows where even exteriors were done on sound stages. You look at old episodes like Star Trek or even things like Big Valley, and you can look at some of those sets. And to me, I look at them and go, oh, that was on a sound stage. You know, I watch something like we just went through Christmas. I watch Christmas movies. I watch something like White Christmas. And I know that that whole exterior of the lodge where they were staying up in Vermont, uh, it was on a soundstage. I can just look at it and tell. So they used to do that because sound stages were big. And so they could just create a whole sort of front yard of some place and use that. And again, they could control the lighting, they could control the sound, they could control just the environment there. So a lot of that was done at that point in time. And then during the Waltons, we were kind of on that transition where we still used most of the studio, but we would go out for certain locations, but um, usually exterior locations, uh, more so than going and using someone else's house. Uh, but then it started moving over more and more to independent type productions where people did and do just go and rent a location, an existing thing. And 
in some cases that is more cost effective now. So that's a long winded answer to the why not a real house. A question here from Courtney who asked, you have mentioned several times that if you weren't scheduled for a shoot on a certain day, you somewhat had the day off, but yet you didn't because you had to be available at a moment's notice in case there was a change in schedule and they needed you to come in. Since that was an era before cell phones, did you basically have to stick around the house near the phone? Uh, how often did you try to make plans only to get a call to report to the studio? <laughs> yeah, that would definitely happen. Uh, you might have the day off, you thought, and then perhaps the night before, you'd get a call from the assistant director saying, uh, we might need to shift things around, you're kind of on call. Or they could just say, mm, we shifted around and we need you here at nine o'clock tomorrow. So that would happen. Uh, it was tricky because as you say, we did not have cell phones. People had answering services, I never did. Pagers were just starting to come in. I don't know that I had a pager either. Sometimes if there was some question, they might say, call in at this time to check and make sure we don't need you. Or sometimes if you were sort of on call, but they didn't know what time and they were trying to give you as much freedom as possible, they might say, well, call us at 10. Okay, it's looking okay, check back at noon. Uh, and we'll let you know if we need you right before lunch or right after lunch. So you could have things like that. Um, sometimes it was just evident you were going to have the day off. Maybe you were done with all of your scenes for an episode. So you knew that they still had another day or two of filming. So clearly, unless they added you to a scene, then you weren't going to be needed. But it was very tricky to try to schedule appointments. Even with a cell phone, that's very difficult when you're filming because you can think you have a day off, you know, or you try to book an appointment, you know, I want to see the dentist. And they're like, oh, okay, can you come a week from Thursday? I have no idea. So a lot of those things would end up having to be scheduled in your time off. And when we filmed nine months out of the year, we didn't have a lot of time off to take care of those things. Nowadays, seasons don't always take that many months to film. So... A little more latitude for people these days. This question is from Matt. Uh, how big was the soundstage? There seems to be a lot of interior shots of homes or stores, and I know the houses were mostly facades. Um, so soundstages were pretty big. I couldn't really give you dimensions, but I mean, we had the full-scale interior living room, kitchen, grandparents' room, John Boy's room, the boys' room, you know, the the set that doubled for the girls' room and the parents' room. We had, we didn't have the full Baldwin sisters' house because you didn't see that much of their house, but we did have the main sort of parlor where there was the big portrait of their papa, the judge. And the, that was the room that most of the time when people went to visit them that we used. We also had the entry hallway that was kind of connected to that room. So those two sets were, all of those were permanently on soundstage 26 that we used all the time, as well as the interior of the Godsey store, but just the store and the pool, the pool room area. If they were going to shoot actually into the Godsey's living area, that was not permanently on our soundstage. Uh, one, there was, extra space on that soundstage that they could they could make they could put in a temporary set sometimes they might do the interior of the shed when it started being used when Ben and Cindy lived in there or I'm pretty sure we they built when Aaron and I went and shared an apartment uh, together I think they that little apartment they built on soundstage 26 so those were sort of our pretty much our permanent ones. So it was big enough to accommodate all of those sets. But if they needed things that we didn't usually use, then they would oftentimes have to use one of the other sound stages on the studio lot. So let's see, you had more to this. Do you have uh, to build, rebuild every time one was needed? No, not with those permanent ones. Those were there throughout the season. Now, whether they put them away during the three months we were off and then brought them back in. 
I don't know that. And I can maybe try to ask our good friend John Dayton if he knows what went on between seasons. He probably knows that. So we'll see about asking him that. Uh, did you use the same basic one and just dress it up differently? Um, sometimes in the flats for that they would bring in to build a room were pretty basic and then they might just, yeah, set dress it. So wall flats could be just pretty standard and then they would just bring in furniture and things like that. They didn't redecorate any of the house set spaces or the Baldwin's or the Godsey store. Um, so it would have just been some of those other pieces that were done, like a one-off that they built it for that episode and then it went away and then they built something else for another episode. So those, yeah, um, those weren't permanent. So they would just bring in as needed and decorate. Then let's see, are you stating that the parents' bedroom and the girls' bedroom were interchangeable? So yes, in that case, it was just they would just bring the furniture in. So the shape of the of those two rooms, the girls' room and the parents' room, didn't change. Uh, so they would just pull the girls' beds out, bring in John and Olivia's bed, John and Olivia's dresser, things like that. And then it would be, so just set decoration and things that went on the walls. I have a question here from Mowerden, who said, what were the dynamics like between Lorimar, the studio, and the network during the production of the series? Was it challenging or confusion, confusing for you guys and crew knowing who to truly answer to? Were there many conflicts between the three entities? And did you guys ever get in the middle of their conflicts or did you report solely to Lorimar directly? So there was definitely a hierarchy. On the set, we answered to the director and what came down to the director from the production office, which was Lorimar. Uh, so Earl Hamner or whoever our producer was for that season, those would be the people that we would direct our questions to. If the, if the director couldn't answer the question, uh, then it would go up to Earl or the producer. Uh, then Lorimar, the, pro the producers would deal with any questions with the network. So sometimes, you know, the network would send down mandates, but those would go through the producers through the production office. And then if it was something that we needed to know, it would come down to us. So there was never really a confusion about who you answer to. We might have disagreements with things that were coming down from the network, but we had no direct line to the network to voice any kind of complaint about anything. So uh, as an actor, especially for us, uh, as sort of the children, we were a little lower on that food chain. So we just pretty much had to show up and do what we were told. That's what I have for this segment of Behind the Scenes of the Waltons, Ask Judy. I wish you all a very happy new year and I will be back in 2023. Thanks for watching.